This is Democracy Now! We're broadcasting from Cleveland, covering the Republican National Convention and what's happening in the streets in the larger city. Right now, students at Case Western Reserve University here in Cleveland are protesting their university's decision to house 1,900 armed police officers and National Guardsmen in campus dormitories during the RNC. The security officers are part of an auxiliary force assisting the Cleveland Police Department during the convention. Students have expressed their concern in a Change.org petition, student safety during riot police occupation of Case Western Reserve University. Last Monday, the university announced a virtual shutdown of its operations during the convention, citing concerns that the recent shootings in Dallas, Louisiana and Minnesota could provoke a significant degree of conflict in the city. Case Western Reserve University is located nearly five miles from the arena hosting the Republican National Convention here in Cleveland. We're joined now by Taru Taylor. He is Case Western Reserve University law student who co-authored the petition objecting to the police presence on campus during the RNC. Um, welcome to Democracy Now!, Taru. Thank you, Amy. Talk about um, how many police we're talking about, how many state troopers, and what's happened at uh, Case. Well, initially, uh, we were informed by a whistleblower, essentially, that there would be 1,500 police officers. This was about a month ago. And so that's what prompted our petition. And uh, um, subsequently, we have found out that there would be 1,700 police officers and 200 members of the National Guard who would be housed, essentially quartered, at our university uh, during the RNC. What was your problem with this? Well, essentially, it's a Third Amendment violation that these out-of-state police officers are coming into our university and essentially that there is no consent, that the Pre President Snyder unilaterally decided to house these police officers, and no one at the university knew about this until—not no one, but students and many members of the faculty did not know about this. And so that's what prompted, again, our petition, just to bring awareness to the campus community and also to voice some of our concerns that uh, these police officers coming into town would be under the auspices of the Cleveland Police Department. And so some of our concerns had to do with the fact that in December of 2014, the Department of Justice did issue a report saying that there was a pattern or practice of unreasonable force and unconstitutional policing, especially with regard to the Fourth Amendment. And so, and this is, this pattern or practice is going on all over the United States. And so, those were some of our concerns. And so, for example, we wanted police officers not to have their weapons on campus, so as to follow the policies and procedures of Case Western Reserve. Well, I want to ask about um, Case Western Reserve President Snyder's explanation of the use of the term profiling in a message sent to the Case Western community. After she was criticized for suggesting the university community was, quote, profiling the police, she clarified her use of the phrase by writing, quote, in that June 24th email, I urge that members of our community not stereotype all police officers as violent or prejudiced. Nevertheless, given the current national context, I regret that I described such behavior as profiling and that I was not more careful with my language. What is your that response to that, Taru? Well, <clears throat> that when she basically accused us or suggested that we were reverse profiling, it was a way in which to marginalize our concerns. That, first of all, we were not saying that every <coughs> single police officer is prone to violence. It only takes one um, police officer. Of 1,500 police officers, if 14,999 are perfectly peaceful and one is prone to violence, catastrophe. And so, also, there I seems to, say, to be. These officers are not very happy, also. Um, right. We were walking along. There are officers from all over the country here. I'm not sure if they were at case, uh, but a group of them who um, it's had the badge of the Louisville Police Department 
Um, we asked, you know, where they w were staying, and they said, at university, there's no air conditioning. <laughs> they were packed in there. Um, they drove for many hours to get here, and they were very frustrated. That doesn't help. Right. And I, and I do want to add that there does seem to be a general denial of people tend to, for example, what happened with Tamir Rice um, and Melinda Williams and Timothy Russell, whose, whose car had accidentally backfired, and they were, there was a car chase, and they were chased around the streets of Cleveland. 100 police officers, a third of the Cleveland Police Department, fired 137 shots into their car. Each of them were riddled with 20 bullets. Now, the Department of Justice spoke of this as part of a pattern of practice, but yet there's this want to make this as if this is an isolated incident or as if these are um, isolated circumstances. But again, this is a pattern. And so these were some of our concerns. Where are the uh, officers from and the state troopers? Well, I've. Uh, that's one of the questions that we asked, where are these officers coming from? And the university was less than forthcoming when we did ask about, uh, we also asked about um, vetting. Have these police officers been vetted in terms of the individual police officers, perhaps having histories of unconstitutional policing and excessive force? But there, there, there was not that vetting. And so I've seen, uh, from Florida, um, Tennessee, Indiana, Texas, I've seen et cetera. Indiana, Louisville, so Kentucky. Um, so where are all the students now? I mean, were they tossed out of the university during this time for the police to be moved in? Well, students were offered um, an option to go home, essentially, or that the university would sponsor plane tickets for them to go hmm. elsewhere um, because of the overall shutdown of the campus. Well, finally, Taru, where is this discussion and dialogue going? You live here in Cleveland. You live off campus. Um, but has this sparked a university-wide discussion about the role of police and their relationship with students like you? Sure. That uh, one thing that, that we wanted to emphasize as well is that the university is essentially aiding and abetting these police who, at least since 1999 in Seattle with the WTO protests, have been suppressing people's First Amendment rights to peaceful assembly. Um, we also saw it in 1968 in the Democratic National Convention, that since the uh, militarization of police especially with the advent of the war on drugs, there has been this um, sense in which police have been acting as military, that the framers of the Constitution were concerned with the rise of a standing army. And their specific concern was with military enforcing domestic law. And they, they did put up barriers to prevent um, military acting as police. But what about police hmm. acting as military? SWAT teams, um, the 1033 program, uh, through which the government has been giving more and more um, military equipment. You know, interestingly, I think the Cleveland got $50 million, $20 million will be in various kinds of equipment that the police department will have even after the Republican National Convention. Right. Well, we're going to leave it there, but continue to follow the story. Taru Taylor, thanks so much for joining us. You, Case Amy. Western Reserve University law student who co-authored the petition objecting to the police presence on campus during the RNC. That does it for our show. I'll be doing a report back from the Republican and Democratic conventions Friday, the 29th of July in Provincetown, Massachusetts, at Town Hall, uh, and also Saturday, July 30th at Martha's Vineyard, the Old Whaling Church. Check our website for details at democracynow.org. Follow our team for the latest updates from the RNC this week on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and now staff chat. And special thanks to Dennis Moynihan, Laura Gattesdiner, Mike Burke, and all the folks that made this broadcast possible. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining